Bible according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. It was a tragedy, unbelievably cruel. Apparently, Pilate, the ruler in that area, had ordered some of the worshipers from up in Galilee murdered, and he'd had their blood mixed in with Roman sacrifices as an insult to the people's faith. Now, it was more. It was, it was an act of real power to show who held life and death in his hands, to show that he was not to be questioned. It was a truly horrifying event. <clears throat> and it had shaken the entire Jewish community. <clears throat> So the people have come to this new rabbi they've heard about, the one who was raised up in Galilee, to ask if he can give them some insight into this tragedy. Now their questions are legitimate questions. They're not some test from the Pharisees like Jesus is used to getting. I think the people are struggling to deal with what happened to these neighbors to the north in much the same manner that we do. When tragedy strikes, Jesus hears them grasping for understanding and he asks, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? And from his response, we can guess that this crowd in their quest for understanding has gone back to Deuteronomy in the Old Testament seeking answers. You see, the book of Deuteronomy often gave people a sense of life as a simple equation. If one is good in life and faithful to God, things will go well for them. God will bless you. If one is sinful, things will not go well. God will curse you. And by that logic, that would mean those who died at Pilate's hand in this horrific way must have been especially sinful. And did you notice the people's arrogance? The attitude that's behind their question. It seems to have been, well, Jesus, we know all those people, those Galileans up north, we know they're sinners. So were these ones who were killed just especially bad Galileans? You know, were they just especially bad Muslims? That kind of a thing. We know people's attitudes comes out in their language. If Jesus agrees with their suppositions, it will make a nice equation for life. More importantly, it'll also provide a good way not to have to deal with the tragedy and the family of those that those murdered left behind. Because, you know, well... Somehow, those people deserved it. The questioners are looking for 
a little personal insulation as well. You know, if we can say that the victim somehow deserved it or convince ourselves that such things only happen to bad people as punishment from God, then we can feel relieved, right? Relieved because, well, I'm not a bad person, so I don't have to worry. And, and because if they deserved it, well, then it's not my responsibility to do anything to help. They got what was coming, right? And Jesus says flat out, no. Things do not work in that way in this life. And he tells them twice. Once in connection with this act of pure evil done by Pilate, and then again regarding a kind of random loss of life situation caused by the fall of a tower in Siloam. Jesus says you cannot look at suffering A and draw a connection to sin B. You cannot do that. Yes, sin has its consequences in this life. But bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And all of us are a little bit of both. The story of Job struggled with that issue many years before this situation. Life just doesn't work that neatly in this broken world of ours. There is no simple of equation. If good things happen for us, then God must be pleased with us, and if things go badly, then God must be mad at us, and we must be bad people. Jesus is saying no. But Jesus also sees the people's quest for meaning in life. In light of the evil around them. And he points them in the right direction in their search. He said, unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Now those words in English as we read them sound kind of like a threat. But really it's more of a wake-up call to new directions in life. That's what repentance is. New direction. Jesus isn't interested in discussing the cause of those Galileans' death. He wants to focus on life right here and now. And that's what repentance really is all about, life right here and now. He's saying to them, don't let your life be a cruel joke. Don't die without meaning or purpose. There is only one way to truly live. Repent and believe. Follow me. Live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus' response is focused not on divine retribution. You know, God's going to get you if you don't straighten up. No, Jesus is focused on life. Life right here and now. New life, though. Life as God designed it to be. And you can tell that's the idea by going on to the next part of this passage. The story about the fig tree. Kind of a weird little story, huh? It seems in this little allegory that God the Father is supposed to be the vineyard owner. We got that. Jesus is the gardener tending the trees and we are the trees. But we often drift off target from that point in reading this story. We read it and say that God is telling us if we don't start producing quickly, he's going to cut us down and throw us away. And that interpretation is flat out salvation by works. you got to earn it, you know. Really, that would be like yelling at your pecan tree for not producing and threatening to cut it down if it doesn't produce. If you want pecans from your pecan tree then you had better see that it gets water and fertilizer. You know, maybe some pruning is needed. You got some spray to get rid of those webworms. Otherwise, you're wasting the soil you planted it in. So the message here is that God doesn't want us to be just a waste of skin. And that is why he sent the gardener of souls. The parable shows us who is responsible, not only for our salvation, but for our sanctification as well. 
through his own life, his ministry, his sacrifice, Christ is at work in God's vineyard. Through his Holy Spirit, he continues his work in us, seeking to make us the people that we were intended to be by our planter, our creator. Jesus' message is not, if you remake yourselves and start doing what I want you to do, then I will love you, then I will save you, whatever else. No, that's just the opposite. And his focus is on life, our life. What he says is, I have already loved you before you were born. I have gone through death for you. Now, let my spirit go to work on you, in you, making you into my saints right here and now. His message is not, if you produce, then I will let you live. Again, flip it the other way from how we would normally read this. He's saying, I made you to experience life. Real life, though. Life as I designed it to be. Life without end. So let me now show you, guide you, tend you, equip you, call you, encourage you, nurture you, send you. Let me do that. Let me do my work. Jesus is our gardener of souls. Working to bring forth life and fruit from the ones he loves. And remember, repentance, which is one of the major themes of this season of Lent, repentance is not something we do to get saved or even that we do to get on God's good side. Repentance, Scripture says, is a gift of God's Holy Spirit working among us, working in us, through God's word and sacraments to make us into beautiful, productive pecan trees, beautiful, productive members of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is the power of repentance in our lives, of turning in new directions. The Holy Spirit is the one who seeks to move us daily to seek God's face, to to seek God's will in our lives. When Jesus calls us to repent, he's calling us to stop running. Let the gardener do his work. He wants us to drink deeply of the water of God's word, to let the power of Christ's life nourish us, to trust in him and in his good works In us, not our own. It is our joy simply to put our lives in Christ's never failing hands. As he speaks to the people of ancient Israel, calling them to repentance, he's working to show these folks what real life is all about today. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, he calls us as well. He bids the world to reject those old ways of living, to reject those voices that say, you got to look out for number one, to reject the voices of hate and division, the voices that tell us that anything is more important than love of God and love of neighbor. And remember, those are two sides of the same coin. He bids the world to reject those old ways of life and let him go to work on us and through us to make all creation new. Through the power of his word, he prunes from our lives what doesn't belong. Through the blessing of Holy Communion, he nourishes the life placed within us. Hear his word. Receive his forgiveness. Repent, he invites us, and be made new. And to God be the glory. Amen.